All right. Um, I'm Christoph Pettis. I'm a Postgres consultant with uh, PostgreSQL experts. And I wanted to talk a little bit about PostgreSQL, running PostgreSQL on Amazon's virtual hosting services. So first, I want to admit to a little bit of selection bias about the information you're about to receive, which is, you know, cops generally meet criminals, and doctors usually mix, meet sick people. And database consultants are rarely called in for the people who are saying, my life is perfect. I cannot imagine a better world of Postgres on Amazon. So generally, our contact with people running Postgres on AWS are people who are having meltdowns. So there, I'm sure there are, for every one I'm going to describe, there are a thousand people who are saying, you know, what? <laughs> it's, it's, my life is a dream. This will happen three or four times when I, shoot. So as of about 2010, having dealt with a few of these customers, my opinion of Postgres uh, um, on Amazon was something like this. Don't do that, you'll kill yourself. It's like the first thing is, well, when are you moving off? Was the first thing we would talk to on each customer. Um, and then, uh, but the problem is that doesn't scale very well. Is like 65%-ish of our new clients are running on Amazon. Um, and there, you know, this is not kind of the way you want to introduce yourself as a consultant is, that's great, now let's replace everything. That's just what they want to hear. Um, and in fact, a lot of them were very good matches for AWS. So um, we required a, new, new, a more nuanced view of AWS as the avalanche of AWS customers was pouring over us. So um, that being said, I want to give just a quick level set. I'm sure everybody is totally familiar with, what, with cloud computing, but I wanted to just when, because when I use the term, what I mean. So what is it? There are just too many definitions. I mean, do we mean computing as a service? Do we mean this? Do we mean decentralized storage? I mean, there's iCloud, there's Dropbox, and then there's AWS, and these are all cloud services. What the heck? So let's just talk first about cloud hosting. And um, the one thing that you will get reading, talking to anybody is, of course, this is a total revolution in computing that has, has no precedent before. You know, and so, because you have quotes like this, the underlying OS allows the operator to divide the computer up into a series of partitions, each one with fixed memory size, isolated from others. This is, of course, straight from VMware's literature. Well, no, actually, it's from OS 360 MFT, circa 1966. So, um, okay, so let's, a little more about cloud house hosting. Um, it's about dividing physical machines up into multiple, um, uh, multiple virtual machines using a hypervisor kernel. Uh, term hypervisors, by the way, from 1965. Okay, I'll stop on the old, old, old guy stuff now. Um, and providing these virtual machines as computing resources. Um, the hosting provider manages this mapping of the virtual machines to the physical machines, feeds and waters the, the, the physical machines, keeps them up and running, and provides the APIs to get at them and so that you can use them as if they were real, machine, real individual machines. Um, AWS, Amazon's offering in this regard, has a ton of services. Like every time I log into Amazon, there's another tab up there, you know, usually with like one or two letters and a digit for some new service. Um, but we're, all, we're going to focus on really just two. EC2, which was the original offering, which is basically their computing, the compute service, just like, you know, a lot like Linode or any of these guys, and their storage area network, which is EBS. <clears throat> so there, the Elastic Compute Cloud, which is EC2, there's a huge number of, of commodity servers spread across data centers worldwide, and they divide them into instances. One of the things about Amazon is they don't call anything by its proper name. You don't get a virtual host, you get an instance which makes it seem like it's something freaky and new and different. It's a virtual host, nothing special. Um, there's no magic here. They're just, it's just a machine running your code. Um, Amazon goes a long way to make it seem like it's something weird and special. It's just a virtual machine. You get a lot of different instance types. Um, they vary from micro up to thing. Amazon names their instances to make them seem like t-shirt sizes. I think quad, <laughs> quad, uh, quad XL is the largest, which is, you know, too large even for me. Um, and they, um, as you go up, you get more CPU. Basically, you get a bigger hunk of the CPU that you're running on, um, more memory, and more instant storage, a, a hunk of the disk that's physically in the box you're running on. As far as I know, actually, each of these machines isn't even rated. There's like one disk sitting in there, um, which will be relevant later. And it's how much of that machine you get. And there's a huge cost range. They start, you know, and um, Amazon charges um, by the hour, so from the moment you, you turn on a virtual machine and it's, and it's running to the moment you turn it off, that's what your bill will be, whether you're doing anything or not. 
So just to remind everyone of this, that you're sharing this instance with other customers. It is nearly impossible, unless you pay extra for it, to get a machine that's dedicated just to you. You will be sharing it with other You, They will give you, but you, they, they, they don't lie. If they say you'll get this much CPU, much instant storage and this, you'll get it. But the I.O. channel to the, ins, to the local disk and the network are shared with everybody else on that machine. And the only guarantee they'll give you is if you pay them more money, they'll kind of put your traffic a little bit ahead of everybody else's. That's the only guarantee on those, on those particular resources. This is very important when running a database. There is an exception to this, which are dedicated instances. You can buy a dedicated instance, and that will dedicate it to a particular customer. If, if you, once you provision one of your virtual machines on this, on this particular physical box, nobody else except as in, that has a different Amazon account can go on that machine. It's still virtualized. It's exactly like every other instance. It's just you're not sharing it. Um, $7,300 per month per region um, for the first one. Um, the good news is that's a one-time fee. If you get more of these things, you, um, you can amortize it. So if you're planning to run 1,000 of these, it's 7 bucks a month per server. Um, and the instances cost a little bit more, actually quite kind of a lot more. Um, there's also this thing called a reserved instance. And people get these and then wonder why they're being beaten up by all these other customers, because they didn't actually read what, what reserved means. It's a pricing program. It's a volume purchase program. It's their frequent flyer program. It's not a technical program. It reduces the cost and guarantees you that if you commit to a particular usage pattern, your costs are lower. It doesn't change the tendency of the servers at all. Zero. So don't, th don't go buy one of those thinking that you're getting it dedicated to yourself because you're not. Be way too good a deal. Again, instances are just computers. You pick your own OS from an enormous variety of different I installations. Like the, it's like, um, there's, you know, probably between Amazons and the community, there's like 50 different Ubuntu images you can boot. Um, you also debug your own kernel bugs. Amazon's providing you a bare machine. They don't want to hear about your, your darn kernel bugs. Um, you set up your own infrastructure. Now, Amazon has lots of cool tools to help you do this, but it's up to you to decide this machine's the, the, the server, this machine's the web server, or these machines are the web server, this is my inter app server, this is my database server. I want everything wired together this way. Amazon provides you the tools, but they don't do this for you unless you pay them. And of course, you install and operate your own user level software, like, say, Postgres. And Amazon keeps the lights on. So, um, so that's, that's all about computing. Now let's talk about storage, the, where you put your stuff. So every machine, every instance, comes with a hunk of instance storage. It varies from a very teeny little amount all the way up to, I think the biggest you can get is 3.4 terabytes of giant compute instances. The, they used to call this ephemeral storage, which is probably a better name for it. Um, so when Amazon is calling it ephemeral storage, believe that it is ephemeral. It survives reboots on the same instance. So if you type, you know, reboot, uh, you know, reboot now, it, when it comes back up, you should have exactly the same reboot um, instance, and you usually do, most of the time. There are a huge number of circumstances, though, where it can just vanish. If you ever shut down the instance, it's gone. Actually decommission the instance, gone. Psh. If, it's, if Amazon wakes up one day and decides, we want to migrate you from one machine to another, which they do all the time, sometimes the instant storage comes with you. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, so you really need to treat this like it's a hard drive that can die at any one moment. And the absolute most you can get out of them, and this is for a really expensive instance, is 3.4 terabytes, which admittedly is tons of storage but, you know, for most applications. But still, it's not infinite. This is what Amazon wants you to put your database on, is EBS, Elastic Block Storage. It's a SAN over Ethernet. Again, they don't call, you know, they, they make up their own terms. It's a SAN over Ethernet. It's not, I'm told by the people who are better Amazon Kremlinologists than I am, it's not um, iSCSI, um, but it's basic, but there's nothing, there's nothing super fancy about it. You can get individual volumes from a gigabyte to a terabyte. Um, you can move them from one instance to another. So you can detach it from one instance and plug it onto another instance, which is cool. And you can snapshot them to, um, oops, um, 
you can snapshot them to S3, which is their bulk storage service. Um, S3 is, by the way, this is probably one of the few times I'll mention it. It's a service for big old honking blocks of data, but it's not a block storage device itself. It uses more of a web API for uploading and downloading stuff, so it's not really suitable for anything like a database that needs block level access. A little more about EBS. Um, the EBS server provides resilience against hard drive failures. Unlike the instance, a hard drive dying shouldn't take down your EBS volume. Um, you can mount any number of EBS volumes on a single machine. I assume there's some kernel limit, but you know, 64 is not too many. Um, and you can create RAIDs using M MD to create RAIDs of, um, of multiple EBS volumes, which you may or may not want to do. And we'll talk about that. And a little more, runs over the network. Every instance has a single one gigabit Ethernet port in the back. Everything network related goes through that one gigabit Ethernet port. Web traffic, database traffic, and the SAN traffic. Everything. So the most you could possibly get on EBS is 125 megabytes a second. That's the theoretical maximum of sustained transfer. You will never get any faster than that number, no matter how many volumes you attach, no matter how many, how, what a complicated rate st structure you set up. That's it. That's the speed of light. And uh, it, that really does happen. <laughs> we, you, you push it, you push it, you push it, that's where it touts out. Sometimes it bursts up to 130, but there's a lot of caching going on to and fro, so that probably explains that. A little more, it's not cheap. There's a reason Amazon wants you to use it. You pay, you pay for the storage itself, and for every I.O. operation, a teeny little meter goes click, click, click. Every time you write that wall log, yeah. I can add up, like one of our clients is paying $22,000 a month, one instance, um, one instance, all I.O. It's a lot of I.O. So yeah, the, the problem is you're sharing this with lots of other people, you're sharing the instance with other customers, sharing the network fabric between you and whatever else you're talking to with lots of other customers. And this, these EBS servers are really pounded on. So, you know, the result of all this is kind of slow performance. Um, I love this quote, performance characteristics of Amazon's lactic block store are moody, technically opaque, and at times downright confounding, and that's from the co-founder of Heroku, and they should know, because they built their whole business on top of Amazon. EBS has good days, though. It has really good days. You get, you, you're like cruising along, 130 megabytes a second, um, 20 millisecond, like, um, um, 20 mil, um, millisecond latency, not, you know, Super, but not bad. Really low variability, like it's just ticking along like a clock. And then it has bad days. And it's interesting that we are dealing with a, with a technology that has good days and bad days. You know, it's like, remember the days that you had to like use the Freon because the component was overheating? Um, like two, two megabytes per second throughput and two second latency. And this is like, this is not just one of these spikes. This is like, the whole afternoon, it's like this. And it depends on things you cannot control. There is no button, go faster to press, and there is even no, no throw money, more money in to go faster uh, slot. So having just described all the wonderfulness of ZBS, the first thought is, well, why don't we just use instant storage? I mean, you know, there it is. It's not protected against any hard drive failure. They call it ephemeral, they mean it. If the instance shuts down, you totally shut the instance down, it goes away, guaranteed. And it's not really any faster than EBS. Amazon actually specifically says it's slower. Um, and generally, our testing confirms this. Um, we, our recommendation is just use it for the boot volume. As tempting as it is just sitting there, that's, it's really not a suitable underlying structure for the database. So, but why do we care about any of this? Well, databases are all about I.O., especially once the database reaches a certain size. They are largely I.O. constrained. This limits badly how fast you can write, and for very large databases, how fast you can read. So the unpleasant facts of life, to summarize. It, there, are, there are certain other things about EBS, about Amazon in general you need to know. Instances can just reboot at any time without warning. Bing, there it goes. Now, of course, every computer can fail. You know, we all know this. But this happens a lot, <laughs> you know, but compared to how often a machine just, just fries. <clears throat> if the hard drive fails, your instant storage is gone and, of course, your machine reboots. Um, 
EBS volumes, we'll talk about EBS volumes fail failure modes later. So just be prepared for this. Nothing you can do about it, just plan for it. You know, design the resiliency into your infrastructure. OK, enough level setting. So let's talk about the actual what, what good things you can do to make Postgres go on Amazon. So talk about configuring your instance, configuring EBS, configuring Postgres, and about replication. Because if you're running on Amazon, you're doing replication. Everybody just nod. Just agree with me. It'll be much easier. So configuring the instance. The most important thing is how much memory you've got. Because really, that's the big control. That's the big control. If you can fit the whole DB in memory, just get a big enough instance to do it. Um, 63, 68 big, uh, gigabytes is the biggest instance you can get out of Amazon right now. Um, it's been the biggest instance for quite some time. So they, um, EC2 doesn't change that much, actually, interestingly enough. Um, <clears throat> the price keeps going down. But the, the maxima are still kind of all been the same for years. Um, so if you can fit it all in memory, just get enough memory. You'll use it. If you can't, just max out the memory based on your budget. Um, the, mo uh, the biggest, highest memory instance that you can get out of Amazon will cost you about 1200 bucks a month. So that's the upper, that's the maxima of what you'll pay uh, for just the instance, not the I.O. And uh, which distribution to use? Uh, use Ubuntu 11, 1104. See, I just saved you tons of time. Every other Linux distro has had, pro we have run into problems. Tw um, um, Ubuntu 12, kernel freezes, frequently enough to be a problem. Um, this was confirmed by um, Instagram, one of our clients, and they run a lot of these servers. So they just say, use 11.4, don't even think about 12 at this point. So that was easy. So CPU. Um, in reality, you almost never run out of CPU on a Postgres server on Amazon. I.O. is almost always the limiting factor. Um, there are specialized cases where, the, where you will run out of CPU, but generally, at the point that you've, the point that you've cranked the, the memory high enough, you've given yourself enough CPU as well. Um, any number of people can come up with any number of pathological cases where this is not true, or you know, good business models, I guess, another word for pathological. But, um, they're not, but generally, this is true. If you're, it's a budget decision, always go for more memory than the CPU. Don't push just to get the extra CPU. Sp um, save the money for the memory. Of course, in Amazon, you don't have a lot of choices, so they come together. But, and um, generally, our experience is when you exhaust the CPU, it's because other stuff is running on the box besides Postgres. So don't do that. Don't run your JBoss server. Don't run your mail server. Don't run all that stuff on the box. It's annoying. Just give give them their own instance. That's one of the nice things about Amazon. You can you have to like order a new Supermicro box. So configuring EBS. I resist the temptation to like circle the floppy and put EBS down there. Um, <laughs> really, there's only one. To say. The good thing about EBS is it's really easy to configure. Do you rate it or don't you? That's it. That's the only decision you have to make. Um, there is some folk wisdom out there. It's like the problem with Amazon is they're very, very opaque about their technical de details. So this whole like homeopathy thing has sprung up around Amazon of like, well, you know, I smeared it with this ointment and it worked better. You know, it's like. Um, like pre-zeroing the EBS volume, it doesn't work. Um, if you measure it enough times, it averages out. RAID 10 does, is not, is not, um, does not help. Um, you don't need the RAID 1 because it's already a RAID 1, or, or, the, or probably I think it's the, uh, the rumor is RAID 5, all the way over in the EBS server, or RAID 6. So, <clears throat> so here's the pro-RAID argument. Almost all the measurements show, um, show RAID, zero uh, RAID 0 across multiple EBS stripes outperforming a single volume. Almost all. Some customers routinely get terrible performance off of this. Isn't this a great technology? <laughs> I, you know, it's like, it's, it's like a full employment program for consultants. Um, the, so it's less, the variability is less on writes than reads, but it's still, be it's still better. They, they're closer together on writes than reads, but it's still better. Which makes sense, given that on a write, it has to push it out to all the stripes. Generally, eight stripe RAID 0 seems to be the place that the, um, the, place that the curve starts flattening. So there's not much point in going beyond um, eight stripes unless you need more than eight terabytes of memory of, of, this, of EBS space, at which point throw more stripes on. So the anti-RAID argument. Um, one of the nice things about it is you can snapshot an EBS volume to S3. 
push a button, makes a snap, makes a, an atomic copy, doesn't handle the Postgres side of it, but the underlying files, files get moved over. Um, but if you have a Stripe, you do that one at a time and you've just lost the consistency. So you actually have to quiesce the volume, which means, usually means taking Postgres down. So that's kind of annoying. Um, if you have 64 instances, remounting them all on a new, or 64 EBS volumes, remounting them all and rebuilding the rate on a new instance is kind of a pain in the neck. You definitely want to script that because you don't want to get it wrong. Um, and the problem is, you just added all of these variables together and it only performs as well as the slowest member. So you have even more variability in the EBS rate stri in the EBS, in your EBS volume, which isn't kind of what anyone wants. And since you now have more volumes, but, each, but only one failure, but, but one failure takes down the whole set because it's RAID zero, you just increase your chance of losing your data to an EBS failure. And it's like, wait, wait, what? EBS volumes can fail. We have one particularly unlucky client. This has happened to you three times this year. Yeah, it, it does, it happens. Um, generally, this, the, generally the way you find out about this is the, the um, it reboots. It tries to mount the EBS volume and, the, and Amazon says, what EBS volume? <laughs> oh, we stopped building it for that EBS volume that doesn't exist. So we'll give you a refund. Um, there'll be you know, all four dollars of it. Um, and if one stripe fails, the whole set's useless. Well, that's exciting. So you have to plan for this. It's just like a failure on a, RAID zero, uh, on a local RAID 0 cluster. You just have to plan for it. So, tips and tricks. Um, just use XFS. There's really no reason not to. Um, <laughs> although really, as long as you're not using ext3, you're okay. Even ext2 is better. Um, set the read ahead to, to um, 64K. Set the chunk size on RAID to 20, 256K. Um, and use the deadline scheduler or CFQ or no op. <laughs> Well, the difference between these is actually pretty small. Deadline, deadline like peaks ahead a tiny bit, but again, lots of noise in this data. Um, but that's kind of it. Those are all the numbers you need to know. Okay, well, we have our instance that we've sized the database and we have our EBS volumes and they're all mounted and humming along and you're watching the cost tick up. So you better get your database up quickly. Um, again, instances are just virtual computers, nothing special. Anything you would do to tune Postgres normally, just do it here too. There's nothing super magic about one of these. Um, the full, this is obviously can't be a full Postgres tuning talk. Uh, check out Josh Berkus's Five Steps of Postgres Performance talk. He's, he's a coworker of mine, so of course I'm gonna plug his talk there. But there's lots of good Postgres tuning resources. Um, so do all that stuff, definitely. Um, but the basics specifically to EBS, or to Amazon. Only run Postgres on the instance. Um, just put all PG data into a single, um, on, onto, onto the EBS volume, striped or not, depending on what your decision is on that regard. It's fine to put the operation logs, the text logs, error logs. Do those have an official name? I've never really known. Um, <laughs> on the instance storage. But PGX log, put it on the same EBS volume as the rest of the database is our recommendation which is exactly contrary to the normal advice that you'll get if you're running on your, your own machine. One of the first things that any um, consultant will tell you to do is move the X logs to their own set of disks because the seek characteristics of the, the main database volume and the, and the um, X log volume are completely different. One's just going writing data and the other one's moving all around doing indexes and all sorts of crazy stuff. The problem is you're sharing this server with half the country. You cannot optimize the seeks. It's like you're, you have that tiny little slot that's left over when Reddit is running on the entire rest of the machine. Somehow you're not, you're not going to be able to predict that you can get a good sequential read off of that EBS volume. So don't even try. Um, and anyway, if you lose the EBS volume, database is toast. So there's really no extra redundancy that you're getting by moving the X logs to someplace else. Don't put it on instant storage. <laughs> that's very tempting. Bad idea, because you've just registered the database recoverable if the instance fails. If the instance has not failed, if the instance fails, but your EBS volume is okay, you can reattach it to a new volume, bring it up, Postgres will dutifully re do, enter recovery and you'll be in good shape. So, 
Now it's time for the hardcore what, um, um, what parameters to set in your PostgreSQL.conf. There are two. Set random cache cost to 1.1. Why 1.1? Beats me, it seems to work out. There's actually some, there is a little bit of more analytical knowledge behind this. The problem is that you can't, once again, you can't control the seek behavior on EBS. Random reads and sequential reads on EBS are lost in the noise as to which is faster or slower. So um, given that, sequential reads can be a little bit faster if the EBS server is otherwise unoccupied for, for the reason that anyone is. So 1.1 seems to be better than 1.0. But this, you know, the, the, um, I will admit there's a certain amount of voodoo baked into that number. Um, effective I.O. concurrency. If you're doing striped raid, set it to the number of stripes. If you're not, leave it alone. Great, you've just tuned Postgres for, for Amazon. Pretty cool. Uh, now it's time to set up replication. If you're running Postgres on AWS, you need to be doing streaming replication or traditional wall shipping. Just do it. The problem is, as I have described to tedious detail before, lots of things break all the time on Amazon. They call them, they, this, they, you know, they're using terms like ephemeral and things like that. The message they are trying to give you is these things are not these super expensive computers that are hardened and with, um, and, and, um, with redundant everything. Things just go away all the time. So you, the, the, generally what you want to do is string replication from one instance to another. Um, the second instance doesn't have to be as capable as the first instance. Generally, it doesn't need as much CPU, because mainly what it's doing is keeping up with the primary. Um, unless you're actually using, if you're using it for queries, of course, uh, using it for read-only queries, then you want to size it appropriately for the CPU usage there. Um, Amazon has this thing called availability zones, which are kind of sort of like data centers. Um, it's unclear exactly what they, or they're parts of data centers. Again, they can't give anything its proper name. Um, but the reason these are important is you have to put the replica in a different availability zone. You have to. You have to. Don't argue. Just do it. The reason is Amazon appears to have customer affinity for machines in the same availability zone. So if you create two instances on the same availability, in the same avail availability zone, easy for you to say, it will generally provision that instance on the same physical machine. The problem should be immediately obvious of what putting the replica on uh, there. It's the, putting it in a different availability zone is the only way of guaranteeing that it'll be on a different physical machine. By the way, there is a trick, which, another trick, which is if you're getting pounded up and your instance is performing really terribly, try creating a new instance in a different availability zone because you may just be in a bad neighborhood. You know, again, you may be like, the, oh, look, there's a slot available, available on Reddit server. You know, so. So EBS snapshotting, one of the coolest things about Amazon. Um, because you know, um, dealing with SANS and SANS snapshotting, it's kind of a pain in the neck. You're like down in the manual trying to figure out, you have to install this program and do all this stuff. And, and this, it's like, put, run the command line. Please snapshot it. Bing, you're done. It's great. Um, it's specifically great for doing point in time backups. You know that because one of the extremely cool things about Postgres, and I spend more time explaining to people over and over again that for a point in time backup, the underlying file system image does not have to be perfectly consistent. You don't have to quiesce Postgres. You don't have to tell Postgres to stop writing to the data. They just don't believe it. It's so cool. Um, so doing a, doing a SAN style, style snapshot for doing the base backup of a point in time backup is perfectly reasonable. Um, just make sure you're saving the wall segments also. Another good reason to have them on the same volume. And um, there's actually Heroku has this guy, Wall E that's a set of Python scripts that do this for you on Amazon. It's super cool. Writes all the, saves all the stuff to you in S3. Very neat. One button, just push a button, you've got a point in time backup. Move it to a different machine, mount it, reprovision it. Makes it really easy to create string replica slaves. So disaster recovery. So yeah, if the, the giant planetoid hits Earth, people can still buy tickets off your site. Um, put a warm standby in a different region. 
Amazon, so you know for sure it will be in a different data center with largely different connectivity requirements. Because ultimately, Amazon is running on the same public internet we all are at certain levels of periphery. If that public internet starts having indigestion or a meteorite destroys Virginia or something, you know, you're in good shape. One of the nice parts about this is it's a warm standby rather than a streaming replica. You can allow for point in time recovery by keeping the wall segments and multiple base backups, which is very handy because um, <clears throat> um, hot standby is great for a large class of failures. Oops, I dropped that table is not one of the, cl the class of failures that it's good for because it'll push that drop right across the streaming connection just like anything else. Um, and before you have a chance to say control C. So generally we say like you can keep two to four backup snapshots. I mean, if your database is gigantic, you know, you're going to start having, you know, these things are going to be big. Um, maybe do two to four backups a week. Maybe. Again, you're using the snapshotting. It's really cool. Um, so if you're doing replication, monitor, monitor, monitor. Monitor everything that's going on. Um, because it's really easy to fill up disks with replication if something goes sprawling. Because wall segments start piling up somewhere. You know, it's a very common scenario that the, that the secondary goes down. The wall shipping keeps going. But it, it's not cleaning up these wall segments on the secondary anymore. So eventually that disk fills up. The, um, <clears throat> so, and then the master goes, huh, I'm not able to successfully push these wall segments across um, doing, doing wall shipping anymore. So I better keep on to them in case the secondary gets up. It comes up, and then its disk fills up. And that's kind, of, that's kind of a naughty problem. That's a little bit of a tedious problem to recover from. So monitor disk usage at the minimum. Um, if you don't, aren't already familiar with it, check postgres.pl on bucardo.org. It's a Nagios compatible plugin for doing all this stuff. It can monitor things that you would never in a million years want to monitor, but it can monitor a lot of useful stuff also. Um, OK, so quick break for, I'm going to take a quick breath and questions at this point. I'm either completely missing the boat or overwhelming you with data. Well, OK. Um, yeah, I love being in this session. But OK, I'll talk louder. Um, so scaling, like a fish. So you know, but you've done all this stuff, and you've tuned it, and you did it, and you, the high memory quadruple extra, um, extra large instance, this is a real instance name, by the way, uh, with its eight stripe rate EBS mount, and you've run out of, and you've run out of horsepower. Uh, OK, now what? So first, most scaling issues are really application issues first. You really haven't driven Postgres to the wall. Um, there are things you can do on your application, like if there are things in the database that don't need to be there, please take them out, like web sessions. Um, move as much read traffic as you can onto your streaming replicas. That's what they're there for. They do a great job of that stuff. Um, memory's cheap, so just keep throw more memory on the box if you haven't maxed it out already. Um, you can aim for a shared nothing application layer um, because then you can provision and terminate um, app instances as you need to without a whole lot of folder all. One of the nice things about Amazon, one of the best things about it is, is it makes it really easy to spin up and spin down these instances. You create your own AMI, it's a machine image, a saved machine image, and you say, oh, I need a new app server, Bonk, bring it back up. You know, companies like RightScale and Heroku, this is basically their business. Uh, Heroku does a lot more than this, but you know, it's, um, this, is, this is one of the cool things about Amazon is you can t bring up and tear down these instances, um, so use that. Um, as much as you can, digest and cache stuff, page fragments, um, result sets from common queries, all this kind of stuff. Use Redis for web sessions and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's an in-memory database that'll handle this kind of stuff. It's what it's there for, does great. And you do all of this stuff and then you still smash into the wall. So generally where it happens is you run out of write capacity on your main database. It just can't keep up anymore. And because it's the main database, you really don't, there's no place to go. The, 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 the secondaries don't help you here. Um, generally what will happen is, depending on your workload, at a peak moment, suddenly all the needles go into the red and it's taking longer than, it can, than you can allow. So unfortunately at this point, if you're staying on Amazon, well, if you're doing anything, you need to make some tough decisions. So what everyone wants to do is sharding. Everyone loves sharding. It's the shard in London. Um, which is you partition the database across multiple database servers. You isolate the stuff that you can um, so that each database has a portion of your total data 
and then duplicate for um, use for consistency purposes the rest of the, st the smaller stuff across it. It's great for a particular class of workload, which I would say is the, where the workload is proportional to a small atom of business, like a user or um, a like or something like that. Those tend to be more shardable kinds of applications. Um, sharding has lots of fun challenges, um, like keeping IDs unique. There's a really good paper from Instagram about their method for how they kept IDs unique in their sharded architecture. How you write work, route work to the right database, because now you, know, you have 64 of these databases and you need to figure out which one you need to query to do something. When you have shared data, you want to push it like, say you're a, you know, say, um, um, say you're Groupon. This is completely speculative. I have no insight into Groupon's architecture whatsoever. You would, can imagine the deals are kind of all spread out across all the databases and the users are sharded. But you, so you need to distribute the deals across all the databases. So you need an architecture to do that. And um, when the, one of these fails, what do you do? Um, also, for reporting, you are almost always going to have to do consolidated queries across all these databases. And how do you do that without suddenly crushing yourself just like you tried to avoid by sharding in the first place? Um, so let's talk a little more about that. Um, some of the solutions you can do is, well, let's export everything to a central data warehouse because presumably this data warehouse can take a little longer to run one of these gi ginormous queries than the things that are actually handling front-end requests. Um, you, could, you can just go ahead and distribute, the, or you can go ahead and distribute the queries. Um, just send an individual query, pull everything back in. Uh, PL Proxy is really cool for this. If you're not familiar with PL Proxy and Skype tools, it's a um, mini embedded language for Postgres for doing this kind of distributed querying. Um, and then you can build your own aggregation on top of it. It's really neat. Check it out. Um, sharding is not for anyone, uh, for everyone. Um, and there are at least two categories in my mind that really are not great for this. Your traditional data warehouse, hard to shard because, at, because the sharding pattern is completely non-obvious. You come up with this great sharding pattern, and then the next query needs a different one. And it's really, not, there's, it's really hard to come up with a totally consistent sharding pattern that will help you. Some cases you can, but not all of them. In applications that do extremely high write volumes, um, like sensor data, things like that, where there's this huge inbound traffic and the, the database, uh, real time applications where the database has to keep up. Sometimes you can make sharding work if, again, there's kind of the right, right distribution pattern. But these run out of steam on Amazon very, very fast because of the latency and throughput problems of EBS. And again, sharding is very cool right now, and it's a really neat architecture. And if you, build, you can build your application this way from zero, you will be very happy you did. But if it's not the natural application architecture, don't deform it just to shard because, because of Amazon. So if you're building from zero, and you really want to, and you think, well, I might throw a switch and a million people will show up. That would be cool. What, what should I do? <clears throat> Design it for sharding. Just assume that, th that you're going to have multiple databases and figure out all these problems right from zero. Every instance is disposable. You know, remember the good old days we would, like get, we would buy servers and they'd all come up and there'd be a stack of seven and we'd name them after the planets or something like that. And we'd say, you know, this is Saturn and it's my friend and you know, all that. <laughs> These are Kleenex, you know, throw them away, use them, get rid of them, you know, give them numbers, you know, call the turkey entree, you know, just don't do that, you know, don't become, don't think of them in the way we did before, you'll be much happier on Amazon if you can think of them as, we need more compute, go turn the compute dial up, you know, it clicks up in units of an instance. The thing that is cool about Amazon and where they are still to this day, I think ahead of everyone else in this arena, is they have really cool APIs. Um, everything has a cool API. Mechanical Turk has a very cool API. So you, you can have your computer tell people to do things. It's pretty neat. Um, I would say a load testing API using Mechanical Turk would be kind of a neat thing to build. You know, just send out this Mechanical Turk test. Everybody go pound on my website now, please. Um, probably be expensive, but it'd be neat. Um, but provisioning a new server, mounting, moving ABS volumes around, all that kind of stuff, it all has the um, APIs. In fact, you can do more with the APIs than you can do with their console. So use that and automate everything. When you want to create a new app server, that should be one button. I need a new app server, please. 
So at this point, the answer is, okay, this is a ton of information, but what do I do? <laughs> How do I make this decision? And so I'm going to try and distill this down. This is the reaction I generally get when I go through this and say, but should I run on Amazon or not? Okay, here's the summary. Yes or no. Generally, if you have a small database, your application is not particularly write critical. It's not, not being swamped by writes. There's a lot of locality of reference in the database, even if it's a huge one. So you're not doing queries across everything. You can partition the tables or do something. So, that the, so generally, you will have a, a, consist, a small working set in memory. And you're at, or your application is shardable. That tends to indicate a yes for Amazon. If you have a large database, and by large, I mean over a terabyte in this case, it's right critical. So you have to keep up with, with a large real-time volume. You generally don't have locality of reference. When you, when you do data analysis, it's across the whole darn thing of this one terabyte database, so um, I.O. is going to be extremely important. And your application is really not that easily shardable. That tends to indicate a no for Amazon. You know, traditionally, like your, your basic web, web OLTP application tends to be not a bad fit for Amazon. There's a reason it's called Amazon Web Services. Um, data warehouse tends to not be as good a fit. But again, this is like uh, two axis across the 25 axis dimension of possible database applications. So you need to judge it for yourself. <clears throat> or, you know, no reason everything has to be on Amazon. You can develop on AWS and deploy on traditional hardware as long as, you, as, long as your deployment and um, development environments are reasonably close. Amazon's great for this kind of thing because you need, you know, destroy the instance when you go home at night so you're not paying for it. Um, <clears throat> You can put the uh, primary web facing services on a, uh, and the data warehouse, this back-end data warehouse, on um, traditional <coughs> hardware. Um, however, by this I don't mean run, run the database that these web services are talking to, to, to it, because that, the network traffic, you'd have to have this big hop across the public internet to the uh, database, and th that would probably kill you. Well, again, specialized applications maybe. But for example, the web facing service could collect all this data and pump it up to the data warehouse regularly, something like that. There is another option. People like this option. I don't, maybe I'm just like too old and in the way, and I'll get to love it eventually. Learn to love the bomb here. But um, you turn off all the Postgres safety features. F-sync off, that implies synchronous commit off. Just, you don't care. Um, you rely just on streaming replication to preserve your data. So both the master and the slave, F-sync off, and you figure, how bad could it be really? Um, <laughs> You treat everything as disposable. If one goes down, it's like, yeah, well, you know, it's like, it, yeah, well, things happen, you know. And just hope this numbers work out in your favor. Um, we do not recommend this. And above all, avoid Amazon Stockholm Syndrome. Um, this is where I've gone into clients where it's like, uh, I will give this whole thing, that, like, like you're spending $22,000 a month. You could buy a gigantic server on your credit card and hire someone to run it and save $10,000 a month. And they say, well, yes, but how do we fix this problem on Amazon? <laughs> okay, I'm you know, paid by the hour. Um, <laughs> no one cares. No one comes and says, you know, I'm going, to buy my, I'm going to buy this laser pointer from you because you run on Amazon's web services. No one cares. If, if you're not getting what you need from the move, it's just a resource. No, you know, it's this, um, and because remember, it is just about cost. The traditional cost model that we all grew up with was there's this really high buy-in. You you know write this giant check in this giant server with all the spinny disks arrives, and then you have to figure out a place to put it. The cost is in bumps and jumps. There's this big upfront cost. You have to hire someone, and that burns a lot of money and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's really hard to scale this kind of stuff on demand because, you know, oh, shit, new server. Um, and, but there are a lot of economies of scale of this model because once you've hired your first DBA, you probably don't need a second one for quite some time. Um, the, the new hip and with it Amazon cost model basically starts at zero. You know, you, log, you sign up for AWS, not costing you anything yet. It pretty much, the more capacity you use, the more you, you take. It's very easy to provision up and down. 
You know, everyone goes home, you know, you're, you're a winter, you know, your business, that only, you're, you're selling tickets, ski lift tickets during the summer, turn the number down, very easy. The problem is there's no economies of scale. There are, Amazon Web Services has huge economies of scale. Those all go to Amazon, not you. Um, the fact that you can get discounts on them, that's not economies of scale, that's just a discount. So here is, here's my graph that explains it all. The most oversimplified graph in the history of computing. Um, so we have capacity and cost. Basically, the traditional model kind of goes up and then suddenly, oh shit, new server, bonk. New server, bonk. You know, there's a little bit of a rise because of bandwidth. Amazon just, but eventually they will cross. You may have to, it may be like right here, depending on your application. It may be like, you know, way over there in Quebec, but they will cross eventually as capacity goes up because eventually the economies of scale will work to your favor, not Amazon's. So remember, when you're costing this, bandwidth is extra on Amazon, as it is everywhere. Um, and IO operations are extra. This is what can really kill you on Amazon. Because the, um, once you bought your server, HP does not come in and write you, send you a bill for every time that you use their RAID card to write to the disks you bought. Amazon does. And these can easily swap the instance cost. You, you, know, you use the calculator and you come up with the say, oh, well, our instance is about 300 bucks a month. That's not bad. That's great. And then you start running it and your first bill comes. And then you get like two days later, you get one of these emails from Amazon saying, we've noticed your usage is slightly higher. Um, hope the $8,300 bill you're about to get is OK. Be sure to include, and so just include these in your estimate. And a note about staffing, because this is one of the places that the universal thing is, but we don't want to hire dev staff, uh, op staff. Cloud hosting doesn't mean no operation staff. Remember, they're selling you computers, not um, so um, you can defer cloud hosting farther out, but eventually you will need people. Eventually your system will reach a level of complexity. You will need someone to help manage this for you. At that point, you might pick up the phone and call Heroku and say, you know, help, because this is one of the things they do. They push that, that point way farther out on the curve for you, but eventually you will. Just as a, you know, take this for what you will, but every one of our large AWS clients has at some point had to hire ops staff. Generally just one, but they've had to hire them because they just couldn't do it anymore and they were getting tired of writing us checks. So, okay, and here we are. Um, if AWS is a great solution, I'm, I, I really like Amazon for the things it's good at. And it's good for a very large class of application. If it's a good fit, use the sucker, use the APIs, use its ability to spin up and spin down instances. You know, talk to people like WriteScale and Scalar and Heroku and really um, bang on it, because it's got a lot of neat stuff associated with it. But don't deform your whole technical architecture just because you think Amazon's the only way to go. And cost it out very carefully. Do these costs, it will not always be cheaper on Amazon. And there we are, thank you. And uh, there I am. It's a business website. That's PGX's website and my personal website. And the slides will be up there. Yes, sir. Yeah, that, that, that slide could be a little clearer. Let me explain what I mean. Suppose you are, you know, or you, you sell you sell goodies and. You have the, the order management software runs entirely on Amazon. So you keep the orders, you keep everything there because there's an obvious sharding model for that. By region, by product line, you know, by whatever you want, by user, you know, users one through a million are on this server. And you keep all the data isolated. You may have to push your product catalog out to all the servers, but the product catalog doesn't grow nearly as fast as your user base, you hope. But at some point you need to say, you need to do your tax return for the year. You know, and so you need all this data. So my suggestion there is suck all the data down as um, as it is as it um, the opera as it becomes fixed to a, a data warehouse that's in house. That's the machine sitting under your desk. You know, probably not literally, but that's more suited for doing those kinds of big data I/O bound operations. That was what I, that's what that's like. Could use some tweaking though. You're absolutely right, sir. Uh, do you know which of your recommendations on building, you know, Postgres, building and so on, of course, apply also to virtual machines, not on the Amazon, but just plain virtual machines? 
Well, the, um, let's see. Generally, virtual machines have worse I.O. than non-virtualized machines. And the main reason for that is there, now two people have to write good drivers. The, the VM container writers and the device writers, and it's hard enough for the, it's hard enough for the people who built the RAID card to write a good driver. <laughs> we've discovered it can be really hard for two people to write good drivers, um, but that's a problem, not a tuning issue. You know, you just have to be aware of that that the I/O is going to be bad. Um, <clears throat> the generally, the um, if you are sharing the SAN, you probably want random, you know, the random page cost to be lower. Because basically what random page cost is, how, much, how, off, um, how willing Postgres is to do random I.O. operations versus sequential operations, like an index scan versus a sequential scan. Um, generally, you want to set it reasonably high. Um, however, if you're running on SSDs, for example, you probably want to set it lower because I, random I.O. is cheaper. Um, <clears throat> so there's the most, the, again, the best tuning you can do on, a virtual, on um, virtual machines is First of all, generally you want to run a, a hypervisor style thing rather than um, a jails type thing. In my experience, the jails style virtualization is lower performance. Um, the you know I, I, that's a, that's a really broad sweeping statement that can has many that allows for many exceptions, but there it is. Um, and always buy more memory <laughs> because the you know the memory the, the the memory isn't shared. You know once once you've got the memory, you've got the memory. You know and and give give yourself as much memory as you generally want to do. There's lots of neat stuff about running virtualized machines. You know you have can keep, you can move images around. You can do all this stuff. There are a lot of really good system management reasons to run virtualization, even if you own the hardware. Um, but you do want to be aware that uh, that it will hurt your I/O somewhat. And how much depends on the, quali the relative quality of the drivers in the stack, sadly. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, can you explain your choice Generally, the, the, the main reason that XFS appears to perform well is it handles journaling more efficiently than any of the other, than um, the EXT3. In particular, I mean, it, again, they're really, it's really more um, of the next generation of file system beyond EXT3. You have, you know, there's basically three there's JFS, XFS, and EXT4. Our experience is EX, XFS is a little bit more developed than the others, and a file system is something you really don't want to get wrong. <laughs> so, you know, we're hyper conservative about that. That is not, there's no slander directed to EXT4, particularly. Um, people run with it, it seems to run great. The thing you don't want to run is ext 3 because the journaling is very slow. Sir. Um, you had mentioned that uh, you recommended cutting the database in memory if at all possible. Mm -hmm. Is that based more from a performance standpoint or more from a cost analysis standpoint? Um, a little of both. Um, Certainly, you, you, um, it's mostly from a performance point of view, but the less I.O. you do to EBS, the more money you'll save. So, um, I mean, that's good advice on systems, no matter of any kind of system, but it's particularly applicable to, um, to um, Amazon, where the I.O. story is so nuanced. This is the right word. Yes, Bruce. Uh, I'm starting to go back to what you said when you originally started, where you basically walk in and you try and say, this doesn't make sense for you, and then you say, but how do I make it work, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. When you start to go over a lot of the sort of nitty gritty details that us as big data people are playing with all the time, like you know, shared I/O and stalls and, and just sort of a lot of the headaches, it's as though you took every problem that that ops people had in terms of sales drives or servers and just multiplied it by ten thousand. You know, one one if one is of a of a certain age. One would say, oh great, we just spent the entire 90s making hardware reliable, and now we're spending the entire rest of them building these unreliable instances on top of this reliable, of this hardware we spent all this work on. But you know, there, 
And, and one could be forgiven for that, uh, that point of view. Again, it really depends on your win. I'm going to give sort of the tale of two clients, one of whom I can name, one of whom I can't. Instagram is the one I can name. They're, they've done a really good job. Um, and, you know, and when I first walked in, it was one of those skull and crossbones things. I said, oh, my God, it's another one of these Amazon things. And then it's like, okay, these guys actually have figured it out because they have a very sensible partitioning model. They, are, they were, as a startup, they were not in a position to say, okay, here's the $1.2 million check for our data center. Um, and now, of course, that's no longer an issue, but, you know, it, but who knows what that path would have been. You know? um, and <clears throat> they were getting really good use out of that model because they could just push a button and say, oh, look, you know, a, a great example is when they drop the, um, when they ship the Android. Suddenly, a million people signed up that day. Um, either they would have had to make a huge upfront capital investment and hope they had gotten it right, or they would just kept pushing the more stuff button, please, um, for, uh, until they reached the capacity. They did a great job. So that's the people where it's like, yeah, okay. They, they thought it through. Another client, I can't name the client, but I can give you the details. They're basically um, a legal research company. That's what they do. Um, people come to them and say, we have this really complicated, le basically, are we going to get sued for doing this? And they have to dig through, um, and, they, and they're the, will we get sued anywhere in the world for doing this? They have this enormous database, and they have analysts who sit there and run ad hoc queries on it. It's on Amazon, and these are the people who are paying $22,000 a month just for I.O., because they have this team of, of legal analysis who are running these, who are typing raw SQL into, into PG Admin 3 and pressing, and, you know, hitting enter and getting results back. And it makes no sense. You know, they're, you know, we've made our recommendations and it's their, you know, we're technical consultants, not business consultants, so it's up to them. Um, and so those are like the two opposite poles for them. And yeah, they're, they're a law firm, they're made of money, you know? <laughs> they could buy the server if they wanted to. But they made this decision, and I think, you know, for, I believe this is a case of Amazon Stockholm Syndrome, um, where they just feel locked into it. You know, they've like bonded with it for this. Um, and the thing, the, the main takeaway I want from this presentation is, it really is just a set of tools with very particular, with, you know, this relatively long column of virtues and this relatively long column of, of um, faults. And, you have to if you can, if the if the if your particular um, application if your particular application really plays to the virtues and can kind of cruise over the faults, you're in great shape. But the, and that's a wide class of problem, but it's not every problem. So, yes. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, I know people. Who, you know, I, I know people who put seven, who put, there's at least one company who puts a hundred thousand dollars a month to Amazon on his Amex. He has lots of miles, um, but um, he doesn't pay for air, airline tickets very often. Um, you know, and again, and in that particular case, again, somebody I can't name. I'm so, I apologize, but it kind of makes sense for what they're doing um, because they need this kind of you know big throttle in the, in the control room for we need a lot, you know, they would probably be spending a lot more than that if they had the dedicated rack of servers running. Well, the business, but, the business model that I'm seeing is people from one division, suddenly they're getting into suddenly they're getting into dev, and they're investigating all their avenues of what they can do with it. There's a lot of analytics going on before they make up their mind. They're just putting up the money. Yeah, I mean, there's, um, as, as somebody in a startup said to me, Amazon is great for, for getting money. It's not great for making money. Um, you know, they, they say it's, if, you're, if, if um, you're going out, if you haven't gotten your first VC round, Amazon makes a ton of sense, unless somehow, uh, but uh, because the, um, the capital expense is, a cent, you know, there's, a cent, there, there's zero capital expense. Um, however, once it's time to start really making, you know, cranking, it may not make a lot of, it may not make a ton of sense. So. Um, anything, any other questions? Yes, sir. Recognizing, I mean, we're talking about uh, Amazon, but comparing it to other uh, cloud providers, especially ones where ephemeral disk is not ephemeral. Right. Uh, 
you know, it's, um, Amazon is probably the most extreme example of taking, sort of taking it to its logical conclusion. The, where other cloud providers tend to, hosting providers is, it tends to be a little bit more hoo-ha to spin up an instance, but you tend to get more out of the instance. The, the instance doesn't have as many performance, as much performance variability. It tends to be more, de the hardware tends to be more dedicated to you, or you can, you can arrange that if you need it to. You tend to have better guarantees about how much, how overcommitted that, how committed or overcommitted that particular hardware is. Um, their billing model tends to be in larger lumps than Amazon. It tends not to be hourly, it tends to be monthly or, or something. And so far, no one's quite gotten the API situation as, uh, as nailed down, in my experience, as Amazon. Of course, you know, I, th this could have changed while we were talking here. <laughs> this is a very fast-moving <laughs> part of the world. Um, so, you know, and obviously Amazon's the one everyone wants to beat. So, you know, they, so that's, so I'm sure that, you know, next week, there'll be some new interesting offering that may address some of these points. But people are, you know, this is specifically about going to Amazon because, they, you know, they're, they cast a very long shadow over the whole cloud hosting environment. Yes, sir? Is Amazon supporting a backup application? Well, they, um, they don't support it as, they, they don't have a built-in technology that does it, but they do offer a suite of technologies that taken together support it very nicely. Um, if you go, to, there's a, if you go to that Wall E um, set of tools, for example, that's a very nice set of tools for supporting um, starting replication that and that kind of thing. You, they do support backups of your individual machines to S3 to their bulk storage, but there's nothing specifically Postgresy about those. You you have to you you you're responsible for making that work with Postgres. So, yes, sir. Well, the problem is it's a little hard to do with M with M MD is kind of the weak link there, because um, you you have to you, um, M MD isn't wild about you dropping out of um, uh, dropping a unit out of a stripe, like that. You'd, so you'd probably have to do a pure RAID ten, which is kind of expensive because of um, there are people who do this, you know, who who do exactly this. There's a lot of discussion about like, well, I I I get twenty instances and I test them and I use the best five. It's sort of like you know like overclockers. You know, I, I buy 20 chips and I run them all hot and see which one burns out. And so the problem is, that's true at the moment you do that. But again, you know, some hot startup may just move in there. You know, again, you, know, you don't get, there's no protective, you know, there's no protective covenants on your neighborhood. People can move in and put up um, aluminum siding if they want. So you can move in and the next door neighbor suddenly throws a loud party <laughs> to overstretch the metaphor. Um, so you don't have a lot, you, you, people, Want, you know, they're you know, we're all engineers. We want this illusion of control. And you have to let go of that on Amazon. Amazon's the one who figures this stuff out. You don't get to, you, you don't get to pick. But yeah, I mean, there are, but there are times we've advised clients, look, just fire up a new instance of different availability zone. You know, people are knocking the windows out and put, painting graffiti on yours, so. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs>